Welcome, I'm happy you're all here. I mean, we've got alumni, we've got faculty, we've got friends, we have guests, and hopefully had a, a nice breakfast. And I can't see out there with the bright lights, but I think you can all see. So could I have all of the alumni stand up for a moment, the people who have been there Yeah, now I can see you. So nice to have you back. Thank you for coming. Wow, it's good to see you. I think there are a few faculty that showed up too, aren't there? I, I saw a couple, and, and retired faculty. Faculty, and retired faculty. Stand up, would you, let's see. Right. So these are the people that made you all alumni, right? And, and got, got you to this point. Well, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a fun time but I thought I'd take just a few minutes and talk about the school, because Elisa told me that I had to do that. <laughs> so I'm Chell Roberts, I'm the founding dean of the Shadi Marker School of Engineering, but engineering has been a long time before I came to USD. This is our 10th year that we're going on. We're kind of excited about that. It's 10 years ago that Darlene Shiley gave this amazing gift to start a school, but 23 years before that, engineering started on this campus. It started with electrical engineering, which is where our love comes from, that we're going to very soon. Um, we've, we've done a lot in 10 years. We had about 250 students that have graduated alumni I don't, in the program. We have over 800 undergraduate students now, and we have more than 300 graduate students. So we've grown. We've become kind of big. That's not big, as big as some. Um, we have not only graduate students, but five graduate programs and six graduate programs that, that's coming. We've gone from 16 faculty members to 50, almost 50 full-time faculty members. It's pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's us um, By the way, the, we, hired, we just hired four new faculty members. Three of them, those are women. We're almost 50% women faculty. That's pretty close, anyway. Um, and a lot of alumni, approaching 2,000 different alumni. So it's a lot of growth in a few years, those 10 years, and it's exciting. We've renovated space. We look a little bit different than we did before. Um, we took a mail room, we took a bookstore, and we created great space for learning and hands-on work. We've created new courses. It's our coffee lab. So we have a creative faculty member design the, a new course called the Design of Coffee, which is one of the more popular courses on campus now. So engineers designing coffee and it always smells like coffee on the third floor now. <laughs> always smells like, sometimes the alarm goes off too. Well, you're not here to, to hear a lot about the school. You're here to hear from Matthew Dominic. We're gonna bring him out in just a second. We were so excited in 2017 when it was announced that Matthew Dominic, one of our former students, was going to become an astronaut, start astronaut training. That's pretty cool. Of course, then he disappears for all of this time. We can hardly talk to him because he's got to go through all of this training and get done with astronaut training. I've, I've heard that maybe he's appeared a few times around, but, but he's, he's been kept away, and we don't want that to happen anymore. Comes from Colorado, came to USD, got a degree in electrical engineering, and then he went off, um, got a master's degree, and became an aviator, a test pilot, and then an astronaut. So I'd like to show you a real brief video of Matthew before we run to it. Uh, I'm a father, a husband, and an explorer. For my whole life, I've always wanted to explore further. I didn't exactly know where I was going to go at any one time, but I always knew I wanted to go further or faster or higher. I remember as a kid going to air shows with, with my dad and just looking at airplanes, and I wanted to understand it. And so it was just drawn to it. Every air show I went to, I, I wanted to go get in that airplane. I grew up in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. I went to the University of San Diego for electrical engineering and went to Naval Postgraduate School as well, Naval Test Pilot. It's certainly uh, a sacrifice for family and friends. Being in the military, you know, we would go on deployments and lose contact with them, and they understood the risk that we were taking. You think about 
the immense responsibility put on you at times. Uh, you don't want to let the world down, uh, but it's about pushing humanity forward and keeping America safe. Watching rockets launch, right? I mean, watching the shuttle launches as a kid was an enabler for me. It's like, how do, how do I become a part of that? How do I join that team to go do that? Godspeed to the class of 2017. You, know, you find out you're getting this job, and that's huge. But really, that first time that you go put your hands into the gloves is it, just a very interesting moment. It's a pinch me moment. And you realize that this is, this is real. This is going to happen. We're going. My previous job was to keep the world from going backwards. This job is about getting the world to go forwards. Poja brings a lot of energy to our team, and he is always definitely 100% in in anything he does. NASA astronaut Matthew Dominic. Wow, way cool. Well, with that, <laughs> let me introduce to you our astronaut, I guess we can say that, our Torero astronaut, Matt Dominic. Yeah, we wanted to we wanted to ask Matt a few questions, and hopefully there's time at the end so that you can ask a few questions. But I'm really interested, Matt. Tell us how on earth did you become an astronaut? Can you give us just a, a, a not that we're surprised at all, but, but that, that path? How do you get there? How do you become an astronaut? I mean, just you go to USD. <laughs> Sure. Next, next question. <laughs> I, I'm joking, of course, but that is, that is a part of it, right? It's uh, how do you become an astronaut? It, it's not one thing. It's, it's starting up having parents that, and a family that nurtures exploration and creativity, and then it, it, it has, you have mentors along the way. Uh, one of the first things I did when I got this job is I just started calling people and saying thank you, right? And I, there's a couple people I haven't found yet uh, just because they disappeared into the ether, which is hard with social media these days, but there are some people that have disappeared. But it, it's really important, and so, you know, you just go through, and you want to go, you know, be an astronaut, right? Like, there, I, you go out on Halloween here in a couple of weeks, and you'll see kids in Halloween costumes for astronaut. And uh, I was telling folks, one of the things I do on Halloween is I carry around a couple of patches in my pocket, NASA patches, and if I see a kid dressed up like Halloween, I just throw it in their candy bucket. They don't know why, they just, I just do it, they don't know what's happening. I keep it that way. But uh, they just think I'm a weird guy. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a common thing for me. My, my college roommate will tell me that. He's right the front row. So, you know, like, I guess to become an astronaut, you, like, it's this thing you want to go do, you know, as a kid, and there's lots of cool things. Like, I wanted to be an architect, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I just didn't want to close doors. And so, University of San Diego being an engineer, uh, I knew that engineering wasn't going to close very many doors. You can go do anything you want after being an engineer. And uh, I didn't want to close doors, I wanted to go farther, because I think becoming an astronaut is, is obviously there's a skill component, uh, but there's luck and there's timing, and I control one of those. And I just wanted to go do things I was passionate about, and I kept moving, like there's an intro video that talked about my life in three minutes. Um, I just kept doing things that I was interested in, things I was passionate about, because I knew that if I did what I was passionate about, I would never feel, it would never feel I was like at work. And so I've never really been at work. But do they call you, or do you call them? Uh, do they call you, call them. So historically, uh, I'd say most of the case, NASA calls you. Uh, in my case, it was a little different. Everybody submits an application online to usajobs.gov or .com, one of the two, try them both. Can, um, can I do that? I yeah, you can. You can, you can, you can apply, anybody can apply. I think we're gonna start an application process here in a couple years for another class. Uh, it happens every four or five-ish years, depending on how many people have left the office. But you can apply, for sure. I mean, absolutely. Not, not make it. I mean, I, I applied in 2013. <laughs> they send you a really nice rejection letter in the mail. You got a you got a rejection letter. Yeah, I have a. I applied in I think 2012, 2013 or so, and I get, you get this nice little letter. You know, many many months after they've announced the new class, it's the government. It takes a while, yeah. but it comes. <laughs> Keep your address updated. So you got that frame somewhere? Rejection. No, I, it's in a file folder somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you apply. Um, 
jobs.gov. USAjobs.gov. USA Sorry. <laughs> so you apply online, you get a rejection, and then you apply again. So I applied again, and uh, there's, a, there's a process, you know, they call references, and then there's multiple interviews. Uh, there's two rounds of interviews. The first interview for me was about four days long, and then you live in Houston for that. They fly you out for the interview, and then this final round is a whole week, uh, seven days straight, like you're working through the weekend to interview. Uh, which is kind of an interesting job interview. I think it was my second, or I think it was my first job interview, actually. Wow. Uh, yeah, I just wow. thought of that, I realized that. So yeah, I mean, I joined, I went to USD, right? And then I was in the Navy, right? And that wasn't really a job interview. They're like, hey, join us, okay. Uh, you, you owe us time. Uh, and then, and then I, my first job interview was NASA, so I think it's okay. That's I'm batting a thousand. <laughs> Good job, that's 100%, right? On your job. Yeah, sorry, Some, do we have freshman engineers to check my math? <laughs> Speaking of which, I met a bunch of freshman years out front, and I asked them who's the hardest teacher right now as a freshman, and I'm gonna out their answer. It's Dr. Kramer, where are you? Oh. But, but they, there you are, you're doing good work. Uh, I had Dr. Kramer, listen to her, but, but we had an agreement, I talked to Dr. Kramer, she's gonna give all the freshmen extra credit. <laughs> We didn't talk, but I just said it. It's recorded. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so you get the job. You get. You make it to the interview. They say yes, and all of a sudden you you disappear in training. What do you do to train to be an astronaut? Uh, you're everything, right? You have to train to do everything. You when you're if you're in space, there's no there's no plumber. You are the plumber. So you're trained uh, to be a plumber. Yeah, I'm trained to be a plumber. Uh, I can fix a space toilet. Uh, I've taken it apart, put it back together many times. Uh, in training, not for real yet. Uh, you train to do electrical work, you train to do fly the space station, you train to do medical, right? If somebody gets sick, you've gotta, you gotta help them. So there's all kinds of medical training that you gotta be able to do. Uh, you train for literally everything. I train to talk to you. <laughs> and I didn't train to talk to you. <laughs> in fact, I probably don't even have to talk. <laughs> but so, so you've done surgery? Uh, I've not, not done surgeries, but I have. Uh, they did give me a suture kit, and I said, I've stitched up a few people in the hospital. That's, I mean, I, that was part of the training. I got a week of training on a, you know, a plastic dummy with somebody, uh, teaching me how to do it, and then I went to a, a level one trauma center for a week. Uh, this is part of the, the course of training. And uh, we went out to the level one trauma center, and we did a bunch of medical procedures, IVs, catheters, um, various you know, shots, um, uh, intubations, uh, and then laceration repair. So I, I sutured up a few people. Cool. It's it's interesting. I was surprised the lack of training required, but they let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys cut yourself today, go somewhere else. <laughs> but but don't you have to do this weightless thing? So they like take you up and drop you from an airplane or put you under water or what? Yes. <laughs> well, so, no, let's elaborate just a little bit. Uh, so we do have. To, like I mentioned I was a mechanic. And uh, I, I just, sometimes I bring pictures to briefs just because it helps amplify the message. And so, this is the space station, right? Could you imagine being that person hanging on with one arm at the end of the world, going 17,500 miles an hour, going around the earth every 90 minutes? Didn't Sandra Bullock do that? Oh yeah. <laughs> Movies are 100% accurate. Uh, Top Gun 2 is pretty accurate. Uh, but. The, you know, you have to train to do this, right? And this is, we're not just out there hanging out for fun, this is super dangerous. Um, at this point in time, this person's spacecraft is their spacesuit. That spacesuit is everything to them. That spacesuit's at 4.5, or excuse me, 4.3 PSI Delta. Also absolute, because you're in a vacuum. This is an engineering audience, they'll get the joke. But the, um, so you're at 4.3 PSI at 100% oxygen, you've got enough partial pressure to survive. And you have to train to do this, right? This is our home. Uh, and the, most of the boxes that you need to repair are outside the space station. And so you see the orange rails. Uh, those are there to walk around with your hands, right? You're going hand over hand. And so gloves are, gloves are kind of important. And uh, we're the government. So most glove sizes come in small, medium, large, extra large. Uh, but we're the government. So we have 42 sizes of space gloves. And. Uh, and so they laser scan your hands to figure out what might work, and they have a bunch of different sizes. And so this is me showing up in my first day to do glove fitting. And uh, we're engineers at heart here, so we understand the importance of testing everything. 
Uh, you cannot skip tests. I'm not a fan of testing, and, uh, or excuse me, skipping testing and just doing analysis. So let's do testing. So we put our hands into a glove box, we call it, although it's a cylinder, but they call it the glove box. Um, and they suck out all the air. So you can feel what it's like to actually have your hands in a vacuum, right? So in that plexiglass thing, uh, there is no air, and that way we're hitting a good glove fit, we're trying a bunch of different sizes. And so you put your pants on two, two legs at a time. Um, but this was a cool, and this is the first day I ever put on a spacesuit. And um, there was, I don't, I don't know who the person was there. They, I gave somebody my phone, and uh, they were taking this picture. Uh, there's lots going on in here. Um, you can imagine it's kind of, this thing is, you know, you're heating and you're cooling, right? Uh, the spacesuit when you're out in space. Uh, your body is the heat source, so the calories you're burning are the heat source. The spacesuit is white because the sun, when you go in insulation for 45 minutes, right, we don't want to absorb a bunch of energy from the sun, right? There's no atmosphere, like, it's a lot of watts, a lot of watts per second. And so, uh, also known as power. But the, you, you know, this is white here, and then there's white down here, and then these are the controls that you have to control various things. This is a 20-year-old spacesuit, but it's incredibly well designed. And then I've got this weird suit on. This is, you know, my midsection, if you will. And this has got, you know, thousands of feet of tubing running up and down that is um, running water through a, something we call a sublimator. And on the back of the spacesuit, once we go to a vacuum, we let a little water out. It forms an ice pack, right? And it's sublimating into space. And we're running water through that ice pack to create cooling. And so all of those little cooling channels are running around my body to keep me cool from overheating. It's a no joke. If that system fails, you have to balance moving quickly to get back inside space station so you don't overheat. Uh, so there, I mean, there's, this is a, an incredible design. I could spend a week teaching you the, the engineering that went into this spacesuit, and how it works, and its backup modes. It's just it's an incredibly well-designed suit. But there was a person there with my phone who happened to be taking pictures my first time coming into the spacesuit, and it, the person just nailed it because this was my expression. Like it just, uh, like, the, like this person, they, like the, what would you do? Like how, what would your face be the first time coming out of a spacesuit? You tell me. So, you know, this is, you know, we have to practice and train. So we go to, you were, this is, I, I was going somewhere. You talked about the water. So you, this is a long answer. So this is a giant pool. It has a full-size mock-up of the International Space Station inside. And we put the spacesuit on and we have an incredible team of folks. You can see all these folks around setting us up. Uh, these are real spacesuits that have been to space, and they're not ready for space anymore. They're retired, but we put them on, and uh, you can see um, these little weight, these little Velcro straps here. If you flip that up, there's a bunch of different weights that you can put inside, and they haven't put them on my spacesuit yet, but down here, uh, there would be more weight packs, and then there's weight packs in the back, and there's divers, scuba divers, swimming around you the whole time for six hours, seven hours underwater, moving those weight packs around so that you don't, you neither sink nor float. And so you're neutrally buoyant. And they spend a lot of time making the tools neutrally buoyant by 3D printing and moving the weights around and balancing them out and minimizing the torques. I'm going full nerd here a little bit. We're but you'll space. do this like six hours at a time. Yeah, yeah. So I'll get in the suit at 8.30. Uh, we'll start briefing at about 6.30. I'll get in the suit at 8.30 in the morning and I'll be out. Uh, by three or four in the afternoon, so you're, I'm wearing a diaper. And this is a, you have an eight to five, an eight to five job. Yeah, well, this is a long day. This is a long day. My kids love the fact that I wear a diaper. Um, they they love to embarrass me and remind the general public that I wear a diaper, but they don't realize that I'm comfortable saying it. Um, I hear this is recorded, so I'm wearing a diaper. Not right now. Um, it's important to put a helmet on so you don't drown. Uh, these are not the actual lights you have in space. This is just stuff that's compatible for going underwater. Um, and so this is, you know, this is how you move around underwater or also in space. And you can see this, these handrails here. Those were installed all over space station, and every one of them has a number. It's kind of like your location. And so you'll call the Houston on your on your hot mic and your microphone and your and your mask and say, Houston, I'm at handrail 3242, going up to see the spur out to the port side to go work on solar array number two. Can you say that again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a very fast lingo because time is precious, and so we're doing something that's incredibly dangerous, and we just we we learn the jargon and go fast. Uh, and then you have all your tools here on the front. Uh, so we just spend a lot of time learning the name of these tools, right? Just learning the names of the. 1,500 plus tools we have to use that we can operate with so that we can communicate clearly with the ground, right? We are their eyes, 
out their ears, we can't scream in space. But you, you know, we, we are their eyes for stuff, and hey, I'm gonna take the, the, you know, this, this tool, I'm gonna set the torque here to this and go. And so, for example, here's one of the big tools that we use. Uh, this is, the real one's very expensive and made of metal. Uh, it has a very specific turn rate and torque for every bolt on the space station. This is what we use underwater because it's neutrally buoyant. Um, but they, you know, we're running around here, I'm fixing something on the uh, starboard side of the space station. That's right side for non nautical types. But that's how I feel about it. <laughs> Have you spent weeks underwater then? Or is it just one week or a year or two years? Are you do it all the time? Or? It's a proficiency thing. So uh, we're always trying to do everything and so that we don't forget it, we keep doing it. So I'm underwater maybe once a month. Uh, I think our minimums for the astronaut office are about four times a year you need to go underwater. Uh, I'm actively training for a space mission right now, so I'm going through a specific syllabus. Um, sometimes we go underwater to test something. Sometimes something breaks on the space station. It actually happens quite a bit. It's giant, it's massive, it's 20 years old. And so they'll say, oh man, we gotta fix this thing. And so we'll go take the two people on Earth with the whole engineering team and we'll practice the repair that we're gonna do on space station 10 times. We'll get the procedures right, we'll get the calls right, we'll get all, we'll do it 10 times on Earth, make sure it's just right, and then we'll email the procedures to the space station and talk it through them. Hey, I might call the space station and say, hey Bill, uh, I did this under the water a couple weeks ago, this is really hard right here, you're gonna really focus on step 22, really think about this picture, and say, hey, this is really hard, here's why. And so we'll have that direct brief to wow. them so they're ready. Okay, wow, wow. So you're a member of the Artemis team. Yes, sir. What does Artemis mean? What is that? How much time do we have? Uh, we've got a clock right here. <laughs> okay, so Artemis is, a, is uh, you know, there you see the PR, you see the quick snippets on TV, et cetera, and, and it's, a, it's a tough thing to explain. So I'm gonna take a drink of water, then I'm gonna go back in time. Okay. Um. So, Artemis is, is our new program to go to the moon. But now I'm gonna go back in time and explain to give you some historic why. So 18, 1820 was the first time humans had seen Antarctica. And shortly thereafter, that was also the first time they'd ever touched the shoreline of Antarctica. And so if you consider the length of human history, that's like not that long ago. 200 years. No, it's not that long ago in the course of human history. And so it wasn't until 1911 that humans first got to the South Pole of Antarctica. South Pole. And so consider that for a moment. There was, this is gonna sound familiar for those who know history. There were two groups, two expeditions racing, Roald Amundsen and Robert Scott, two expeditions, two different countries, racing to go as fast as they could to the South Pole of the Earth. And one beat the other by a few weeks, Amundsen beat Scott. Um, but they were racing, and their only goal was to touch it and come back, because that's all we had. Like, that was the engineering know-how, the scientific knowledge, the logistics, the equipment, and everything that we had to just touch the South Pole of the Earth and come back. It wasn't until 1957 that the world figured out how to build a permanent base at the South Pole of the Earth, and that was the Abundance Scott South Pole Station. That was 1957, so you're seeing like there's a 50-ish year delta between the two, and I could go back in history and talk about different things in human exploration history, where we, we figured out how to, like, I got there, okay, now I gotta go home before I die. I don't know how to stay there, and then we figured out how to stay later. And so, that's the same thing. So in 1969, July 20th, 1969, we put two humans on the surface of the moon. We did six total missions to the surface, and we were done in 1972, but we were racing another country to the moon, right? It was a race, it was an exploration race. And so now Artemis is that go to stage. And so I think one of the big takeaways from what is Artemis is it's, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so, we, we need to take this picture down. You guys need to not stare at that. <laughs> it's creeping me out. <laughs> so, you know, like, let's look at something else. Um, but if you want to go fast, go together. The International Space Station is about going together, right? Multiple partner nations join together to go to the moon together, right? Like just in this picture, this is an international expedition behind us to a crater in northern Canada. 
right, to go do international research in geology. Um, so the International Space Station took a really long time to build, and it's been there for a long time. We've gone far with it and learned a lot because we went as an international coalition. So Artemis is an international effort from nations around the world to go to the moon to build the infrastructure to stay. And so it's building a lunar base, it's building a, 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 a space station that orbits the moon, it's uh, building rockets and infrastructure to go do that, to figure it out. And so sometimes I think about it from an engineering perspective, um, you know, if you think about Apollo and you can imagine those folks the first time they're on the moon, they landed on the moon and they opened the door. They got out, they walked around, they got back in. I think they did it twice or three times and then went home. So the gaskets on that door had to work three times, right? And the moon's not a great place for gaskets. The moon, there's no wind, there's no water that's liquid. So all of the rock or the regolith, if you will, is very, very, very sharp. And there's no, there's no smooth edges, right? Sand on the beach is kind of sharp, but it's, it's also kind of softened by the water. Or dunes or aeolian deposition would be the, the geological term. They're soft, they're round, they're nice. And so the moon is very caustic. It's gonna destroy those gaskets. So how do you, just that simple thing, design a gasket so that you don't leak, so that you don't die, will be difficult if it needs to last a couple years. And so that's what engineering needs to do to go figure out how to go to the moon to stay, how to figure out how to operate on a planetary body other than our own in a different uh, gravitational well. Uh, that's, that's what Artemis is about. Before we, that's, that's the stepping stone to go to Mars later on. So then, then your role in Artemis is what? You're preparing to go to the moon? You're preparing to live up there for a while? You're... Well, right, so my, my background is engineering, the University of engineering, right? It's also system engineering, it's also test pilot. And so I would, in my, you know, we have lots of different jobs when we're not flying in space. And so one of my jobs for a couple of years while I was at NASA was not just training to go to space, but evaluating uh, designs, right? So that we come up with an architecture to go to the moon. And so the contractors, you know, we had a competition recently between Dianetics, SpaceX, and uh, Blue Origin to build the lander to land on the moon. And so I went and visited those contractors. I evaluated their designs. I sat down with their engineers. Yeah, I looked at their human factors, their you know, human system integration. I looked at their handling qualities. I flew all the simulators to land on the moon because it's my background is to evaluate and look at these things. For your engineering, you're, you're oh, still yeah. practicing engineering? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'm mainly judging. I'm judging other engineers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm, not, I'm not doing the orbital mechanics math. I'm looking at the results. I'm giving it a rule of thumb check, right? And then I go to the NASA engineers who are, who are much better engineers than me and go, is that right? right? But I'm looking at it from an operator perspective. But as a pilot, would you, do you ever see yourself flying? Would you be the, like the lead pilot flying to the moon? That's absolutely an option, yeah. So it, it, systems today for space are a little bit different uh, than classic flying. Uh, flying in an atmosphere is much harder than flying in space. Uh, you know, for physicists in the room, like the frictionless surface, well, space is pretty much frictionless. The mechanics are pretty simple. When you're flying an airplane, it's much harder to test an airplane because you know if you're flying an airplane and you change your angle of attack or your beta just a very small amount, you have all these nonlinear effects with the atmosphere and it's a total disaster math-wise and you gotta go to computational fluid dynamics and it's just a mess. But in, in a space, you just bump it and it just keeps going forever. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to fly a space. Well, you think about landing on the moon is way easier than landing on Earth. There's no atmosphere. I've never done that. You're actually done. Right, but I mean, it's, it's, you're just putting out a massive amount of thrust and slowing down against something that's one sixth of the gravity and you have none of the nonlinear atmospheric effects. So, how about Mars? Is Mars in the future? Mars is in the future, of course. I hope so. We need to be a multiplanetary species. But think about, like, like okay, fine. What do this? You're, you're gonna you're hold your hands like this, like a basketball. You're holding a basketball. You are now holding Earth in your hands. It's now the size of a basketball, right? That's a big responsibility. Don't shake, you shook Earth. <laughs> Don't shake, or there are, there are babies on Earth. The, <laughs> so that's Earth, and that's a big responsibility. Where you walk over here. I'm off stage, sorry. Over here, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get in trouble for recording. But the moon is about 24 feet away on this scale. And the moon's the size of a baseball over here. Think about that. Yeah, Earth's rotating, keep it going. We need it, we need the sun on all sides. It's now winter. 
um, the, the moon's over here about the size of a baseball. And so on this scale for humans, uh, the International Space Station is about a quarter inch above this basketball over here. That's only 240 miles. The moon's over there at 240,000 miles, right? And there's limits of physics. So you have to go over there with current propulsion techniques, and you also have to come home. And on this scale, Mars is four and a half miles away at its furthest point. So Mars is a lot further. And the moon is super convenient because it's a circular orbit around the Earth. Mars and Earth are racing around the sun and Earth's got the inside track. So sometimes Earth is on the complete opposite side of the sun as Mars at 240 million miles, but when they're on the same side, they're at 40 million miles. And so I think there's this really cool international component to that where a couple, I don't know, six months, a year ago, I can't remember, all of these countries, three countries I think, launched uh, space probes to go to Mars. And we, they all had to launch within a 20 day window from Earth. Big to meet the timing to go to Mars. And I thought it was really cool. Because it doesn't matter what country you're from, we're all humans and the laws of physics apply equally to all of us. And so all of these countries all had to abide by the same laws of physics if you wanted to go to the Mars. So if Mars is in the future, it's, it's really hard to get there and we need to go test out the engineering stuff on the moon to figure it out. My so, so Mars is a, a lot further in the future than yes. the moon is, and we'll have a settlement on the moon long before we have something. Yeah. I think so. I mean, history. I can try, you're asking me to predict the future, sir. Um, <laughs> if I could do that, I'd be investing. Yeah. But the, I can try. I, but I think it, it's not like people try and think linearly all the time. But I think the progression is going to go like this, right? It's going to hit the moon and just go, boom, 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 boom. just like that. That's how rocket sounds. How about all these companies? It used to be that NASA was the only, at least for the only US-based um, organization going into space, I think. And now we've got a whole bunch. How does that change the role of NASA and, 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 and even what's gonna happen? So I think you know, the sound bite for the news media is a rising tide raises all boats, right? That's the quick answer. Uh, but we're engineers here, so we have to support it with data. Um, Let's just, let's just walk through history. Let's go, let's go through the last 12 years of our lives. You really lives. like history, don't you? Well, I mean, it's prior performance is no predictor of future results, but it's a good place to start. And liberal arts university right here. Uh, let's go, it's 2011. Let's rewind to 2011. 2011, space shuttle stops flying. STS-135, wheels squeak, touch down at Kennedy Space Center. The US no longer has a rocket that takes astronauts to space. The only ride to the International Space Station is the Soyuz out of Kazakhstan. One, one, one ticket, one ticket to space. International countries are all flying on Soyuz to go to the International Space Station. The United States starts a commercial crew program to start building rockets to go to space. Uh, giant inflection point. Everybody thinks they're crazy. You ask professors at MIT, one of my buddies is a professor at MIT, he thought they were crazy. All the professors there thought they were crazy. Uh, and then they did it, right? SpaceX. If people are familiar with SpaceX, it, you know, traditionally rockets have a big booster, it goes up, uh, it shoots off the second stage, it shoots off the payload, sometimes the payload is silenced, sometimes the payload is humans, I have a payload. Uh, the booster stage falls into the ocean and sinks. You gotta go build a new one. SpaceX says we can fix that. SpaceX builds a booster that lands on a barge and they use it again. In fact, they've used a couple of them 14 times, right, the same booster. That is a game changer. That's happened in the last 10 years of our lives, folks. Like, that should blow you away. This stuff has snuck up on us. So, 2011, there's one ride to space. They, SpaceX starts launching cargo vehicles to the International Space Station. Uh, they use that technology to leverage it. So, in May 2020, they launched their first set of humans. Uh, two people, uh, just yesterday we brought home four people from the space station, right? It's just kind of in the background noise. Is that top news today? No, we're just doing it. We're just doing it and it's happening. Like, how many people knew that we landed four people yesterday? A few, right? Like, and this is a nerd heavy room. Um, <laughs> I feel the energy. But the, we, we landed four people from space yesterday and most people don't even know. And that's kind of awesome, right? I think that's really cool. I want to get to the point that it's just like commercial air travel. 
So that was in May 2020, we launched two people on a test flight. And now yesterday, I think if my numbers are right, that company has launched and landed 30 people. And so this is 2022. And we're launching four people every six months. And we've got another spacecraft, so let's, let's count them. We've got the space station, we've got Soyuz. We have Dragon, which is the vehicle I just talked about that landed yesterday. Starliner is built by Boeing, and it's gonna launch a United Launch Alliance vehicle, that's four. I'm gonna not be able to hold the microphone pretty quickly. Um, the uh, Blue Origin has got a vehicle that's suborbital, that's five. Uh, we're switching hands now. Uh, Virgin Galactic has a suborbital vehicle. We have Orion, which goes on top of the SLS. That's gonna test launch here in November. Hopefully that's gonna go orbit the moon, that's seven. We have the Gateway, which is the space station that orbits the moon, that's eight. Uh, we have the Starship. We just got a Starship Enterprise? No, you know. <laughs> we do have some sci-fi folks in here. Where is it? Oh, we can talk about yeah, pictures. The rockets and spaceship section. This is my favorite section. All right, we gotta see the favorite section. So we gotta, there's Soyuz, Russian rocket. This is another rocket. This is a much bigger rocket. It's hard to tell. Like, it's way bigger than this one. But this has got Orion on top. This is the one that goes to the moon, right? Uh, that's a really big rocket. Uh, this is Starship. It's equally as big. This is the top part. That black part goes to the moon. That's the lander part. Uh, the bottom part like, comes back and lands at the launch site. Uh, that's another one of our spaceships, the beautiful, the amazing International Space Station. Uh, this is the gateway that orbits the moon. On the right, on the left. Uh, is Orion, we're building those things right now. Uh, so we're going. We have a spaceship problem and I think it's a good one. So to answer your question, private space companies are great. It's uh, another analogy uh, for exploration, right? Government historically pays for things that um, the, the corporations can't justify to their shareholders, right? We want to go spend a billion dollars to go to Mars, invest in my company. If you want to be a shareholder, like there's a probability of rate of return is super low, right? Incredibly low. Um, so government kind of brings in and says, okay, we'll throw our money at it to make it economic. And so we talk about low Earth orbit being a roughly a 400 kilometer circular orbit where the space station is. We are commercializing that now. NASA is going to start moving out of the low Earth orbit business. We are the government. We're going to put our money on the next step to commercialize further things and just keep moving humanity forward. And so you're going to see private space companies own and operate the orbit orbit and NASA get out of the business. That's the future. What's a day like? What's a month like on the space station? Uh, it's kind of nice from what I, you know, I So I work in mission control a lot. I haven't been to space yet. Uh, but everybody plans your day. You have a, an iPad and a laptop with a move, they call it the moving red line. And it kind of looks kind of like a Gantt chart. Um, my least favorite thing to build. Um, but the, it looks like a Gantt chart, and on the left, on the, hor the vertical axis is every, per every crew member's name. And then on the horizontal part is time, and each block is what you're supposed to be doing in that time block, just kind of like an outlook calendar. And, but it's very specific, like, okay, you need to go swap the seals on this thing. It's gonna, we, it's gonna take you an hour and a half. You click on it, you open it up, there are other procedures. If you have trouble, you call the ground and talk to me and Mission Control or another person like me and I'll say, hey, no, you skipped step 12, get back on it. Um, and so you just kind of do what we call the timeline and it shows you the red line is progressing. So you, you know, there's a scheduled wake up time at I think like 7 a.m. There's a morning meeting at 8.30 after you, you know, take a sponge bath. Um, you meet, there's a designated workout time because you have to work out. If you don't work out, it's a bad, bad things happen. Uh, because there's, your bone density goes, goes away, it's just, it's just a mess. If you don't work out, you're not gonna survive very well. So there's designated workout times with designated workout programs. They upload your workout program to the machine and you just do the workout program scheduled for you by the staff that tells you what you're supposed to be doing based upon your measured performance. Uh, you're a lab rat. And then, you're a lab rat. I, I am a lab rat. Uh, what are we doing tonight, Renee? Same thing we do every night. Anyway, so moving on. The, uh, <laughs> You, you do the timeline, right? And then, well, then maybe you have an experiment to do, right? So we have universities and researchers from around the world that want to see what happens to certain things in space. And so on the ground, I train a lot in how to run experiments. And I am their eyes and their hands. And so when I'm on space station, uh, I might have a principal investigator for a research program in my ear. And I'm running their experimental procedure that I have on an iPad or I have on a computer and I'm doing their thing and they're like, oh, well, what just happened there? And then I'll, you know, I'll explain it, I'll move the camera there over my shoulder with the camera 
and I'll do their experiment for them. I'll help them write the data, collect the data, send the data down to them. And it, it helps them to, you know, instead of building an experiment that's automated on Earth, uh, we can kind of help them get the experiment there, up there quicker, do the experiment, and get the results back to Earth. So we've, we've learned a lot of things in 20 years. So I run experiments, and then I do maintenance. I have to fix the space station. It breaks. It's old. Take your wrench with you and a screwdriver. Oh, they have an amazing toolbox. I want to steal the space station steel box. Oosh. <laughs> it's it fits in the floor, and it's you know maybe this big. It's got five drawers that swing up, and it's just it's amazing setup. I mean, I, I don't like I have all these tools in my garage, and they do roughly the same amount of things as this toolbox, but they take up five times as much space. Yeah. Can we get those for our labs? Yes. Really nice. <laughs> They're very expensive tools. So, but you said you're a lab rat. So are are, are they studying you? Are we studying you while you go up there? Uh, yes, I mean that's also part of it, right? Uh, as engineers and scientists, we know that sample size is important, right? So every time we launch humans to space, they're increasing our n, our sample size for experiments. And we want to see what happens to the human body. Um, you know, we were talking about Mars earlier, and I kind of told you the story a little bit earlier. But one of the people that I work with is is pretty much the world's expert in in uh, spaceflight medicine. And so I'm flying with this guy in the future, I was talking to him, we were driving somewhere, and he's explaining, like in the 90s, he was you know, in the meetings with Congress as they were deciding, you know, we're gonna go build a space station, or are we gonna go to Mars? And there were good arguments on both sides. And, and I think he said to me, he's like, I was kind of leaning towards Mars. And we ended up building the space station for a lot of different reasons, and he says, I'm so glad we built space station. He says, we learned so many things about the human body that we had no idea what were about to happen. And if we had sent people to Mars and they had been in that zero G environment for six months, nine months, they'd have been in a world of hurt when they got back on Mars. And so we've seen this, you go talk to some of the medical folks at NASA that have been working there for 20, 30 years. When somebody came back from the space station after having been there for six months, the rehabilitation time was weeks. Like there was somebody walking next to that person, helping them upstairs for a long period of time. Uh, and now we've got it down to a science uh, where, Sorry, bad, bad puns. Um, I'm sorry. Um, but we, we got it down where now, like I remember when we showed up to Houston for the job, we went to the, every two years we have an astronaut reunion, which is a crazy cool event. People from all over the world come back to Houston that have been astronauts for the past 50 years. And some really fascinating conversations ensue, but we had just had somebody land like three days prior and they were at the reunion walking around, right? And so we were seeing people walking around and mobile within 24 hours. Uh, so that's, that's what Space Station is about, is, is I am the research subject, uh, and I'm adding to the sample size so that we can increase humanity's understanding and move us farther into the cosmos. Don't astronauts take an artifact with them, like a secret thing in their pocket when they go? We smuggle absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen, that's the official answer, isn't it? <laughs> if, if you could take an artifact, which you would, but I know you would. What artifact would you take? Uh, well, I'm gonna answer your question in a different way, but I will answer it. Uh, you get a small, roughly, like slightly bigger than a shoebox size for like personal stuff uh, to take with you, uh, you know, t-shirts, etc. Various small things that you can bring uh, with you. Uh, it's very small. It has to all go through a NASA safety review, right? Flammability is a concern. Uh, the space station is a really, really safe place to live once you're there. Uh, you've been medically screened, there's no, like, you can't send anything sharp, every sharp corner is covered with, like, something that makes it soft. It's like a padded room. Um, I've never been in one of those, but <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's a very safe bed. place, and so they, they screen everything, and so even, you know, like, this is an electrical engineering environment, right, you know, your normal lithium ion battery, uh, for safety, you probably, you know, charge it to 4.2 volts based on the chemistry and go down to, like, probably 3.3, uh, terrestrially, right, because you want to get the maximum amount of energy out of it. Uh, so in space, we don't need a thermal runaway. We want to reduce that probability. So we screen every battery, and then we change the charge controllers to only charge to maybe for, I'm making numbers up right now, but like 4.1 or 4.0, and we drain it only to 3.7. So we get much less energy out of it, but it's much safer. And so everything in that little box is very safe. So to answer your question, uh, my father was in the Air Force, and so, uh, in 1971, he bought like an original moon watch that's analog, and there's no batteries, 
And uh, I have very vivid memories as a kid when we would, every Thanksgiving, we would drive from Denver to Phoenix and for, to go see family there. And there were no iPhones back then, and there was no digital stuff, right? There was no, no data, right? So you had to like live with your brain. And I remember having the Rand McNally Atlas out and the distance between cities, and I would line my head up with the vertical column of the window in the car. And at the exact second we hit the mile marker, I'd start the stopwatch on this chronograph, this 1971 chronograph. And then I'd stop it again and calculate our velocity every mile and then recalculate How our... How old were you when you were doing this? Uh, it was young. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd recalculate our arrival time. And I'd get it down to within a couple minutes. I could probably beat a modern GPS doing that. Uh, but I had it all down, I knew mile marker. I mean, I would sit there and just recalculate, recalculate. Uh, and so that watch is important to me. One is my father's watch. He gave it to me a couple years ago, and I've taken it flying around places. But it's, it's you know, I've had it, you know, refurbished every now and then because it's an old analog watch, but it's a 50-plus-year-old watch, so I kind of take it with me. Very cool. I would imagine that some of you may have some questions. And so we have 10, 15 minutes or so, if you do. If not, I, I can keep asking questions. But I think there are some people with some microphones that, can, that are going to come around. And let's let's see what you want to ask, man. Yeah, I can see people. <laughs> All right, microphone down here. We'd like so everybody can hear the question. Matt, you just uh, told us a lot about all the challenges you you're going through to go to space. Uh, do you see missions like Inspiration Four for civilians happening again and again in the near future? Yeah, those are, those are great. Uh, like we mentioned before, rising tide raises all boats. Um, Jared Isaacman is the commander of that mission. He's commander of Polaris coming up. Uh, actually, we do a lot of information exchange and work with them, and uh, they work with us. We get information from them, so we know the good and the bad things that happen on their flight. Uh, so, you know, the public gets the PR side of it, uh, which is great. They're doing good work. Uh, and then we, you know, we have phone calls with them and we sit down and actually Jared came to, Jared Eisenman came and sat down in our office and he comes to NASA in Houston and talks with us and we work with them together. So it's, it's very much a partnership. Um, you know, they want to, they ask questions or they contract NASA to, to, to give them that kind of information. So, or vice versa, right? And that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Like the government's job is to push technology out to the commercial sector to push humanity forward, right? We go spend that money and give that information exchange. And there's, there's NASA websites you can go to to get all kinds of data for free. Uh, your weather data comes from NASA. All these, so all of these programs are really, really good. Uh, some people, you know, like the media tries to create, you know, these clickable things of billionaires in space, right? But, you know, these people are, are have at it. I mean, they'd much rather spend that money on that than a yacht, right? They're advancing humanity. Have at it. You want to be a billionaire and go spend your money on this? Go at it. I mean, we just had somebody else sign up for a Starship mission to go around the moon. Uh, that's a great place to spend your money, but I'm a little biased. <laughs> great. Well, there's half a hand up over here. So I'm wondering, like, what was the hardest part of your training? Was there something that made you question, like, do I really want to do this? <laughs> There, there was nothing that questioned maybe, do I really want to do this? It's, it's really good. Uh, from a technical side, the hardest thing for me is, is foreign language. So part of the international agreement for the International Space Station is that everybody who goes to the space station shall speak English and Russian, and uh, regardless of where you come from. So uh, he's, you know, a Japanese astronaut has to speak English and Russian and to get in addition to Japanese, but that's part of the agreement. All the space stations don't have barter. So for me, uh, I think it's one, I think it's hard for me for a lot of reasons to learn Russian. It's, it's typically the harder thing to do, but it's also because I'm an engineer at heart and I just, you know, I, if I have two things on my desk and it's like a technical thing, and then it's verbs um, and conjugations of verbs. Uh, and so you're familiar with the Russian word gulag, which means prison, and uh, the genitive form of verbs, so you could say possession is glagolov. Uh, so I would always tell my Russian instructor, and I still do, Gulag Bogolov, because it means the prison of verbs. Um, <laughs> she was not happy. Um, but yeah, so that, that for me is very difficult, just because it's, it's something that I don't really
really want to do. I, I want to learn to speak Russian. I really do, like, out of respect, because they're incredibly intelligent human beings. I love working with them. I go to Russia. I train with, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to Russia here in a couple months again. I've been there for training. Uh, their engineers are incredible. The stuff they build is incredible. And so I learn Russian out of respect for them. Uh, because it's a, it's a camaraderie thing, but it is the hardest thing for my brain to wrap around. Like technical stuff, I'm all over it. I love it. I dive into it. But Yagov <laughs> Ruprusky. I'm just gonna say, speak some Russian there. Got a question up here. Sure. In college, you talked about how you've memorized the Declaration of Independence. Can you do it in Russian? Yes. Did you all hear the question? Can he do the Declaration of Independence in Russian? Because in college, he memorized. Yeah, I, don't, I go back to that document every now and then. <laughs> I, I can run over here. I, I love the glasses. So as you mentioned, there were some students in the space that you got to meet earlier. Can you talk about your time at USD? What were you involved in? What was your hardest class or a class that you learned the most in? <laughs> um, uh, what were your days at USD like? Uh, I learned a lot of good lessons at USD. Um, I think the first one I learned is I was a hot mess uh, because I just wanted to do everything. I didn't. I couldn't say no to anything. Uh, I was involved in way too many campus organizations my first couple of years. My grades were less than stellar. Dr. Lord will tell you I didn't do my homework. Um, uh, I was really bad at it. I didn't like doing it, you know, because I was doing hundred. I had hundred social activities. I was in too many organizations. I said yes to everything. I didn't really narrow my focus until my junior, senior, and senior two year. So I really recommend the Victory Lab, uh, also known as the fifth year. Yeah. I did that. Um, so yeah, I, I, man, USC was great because it's 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 liberal arts, and I really really love the concept of liberal arts. The only thing I don't like about it is the name because people don't know what it means. They kind of go off like what? They think it's a political thing. It's not because um, they just hear that word and cue differently. But it, liberal arts, I'm a huge believer in. Um, it's worth the extra time to be an engineer and do liberal arts, right? And you know, it's, it's gonna cost you some extra money slash credits, because you're gonna be here four and a half, five years. Uh, but you would always see USD engineers out there in the field able to communicate what they're doing better, you know, and more, more well-rounded, right? And so when you go into the real world, and this is the real world, but when you go into, they, you know, the, you, you asked the question earlier, what's the hardest thing you do? On a, on my, I, I scoped my answer to technical stuff. Uh, but the real answer, what's the hardest thing you do is, is, is people, right? Every job I've been in is, is finding a way to meet somebody where they're at, figure out what's going on, and the people side, and having an exposure to a broad diversity of cultures and ideas and languages and thoughts, it you know, gives you a huge advantage when you go out there, and not just you can derive something on a piece of paper from scratch as an engineer, right? The, the, you need both skills. Great. Anybody else? Oh, yes. we got questions popping up everywhere. So as a, as a freshman, when you're at USD, if, if you were to go back when you were a freshman at USD, and you to give your freshman self a word of wisdom, what would that wisdom be and why? What, what would I tell a freshman? Well, first get your extra credit from Dr. Kramer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What would my wisdom be? So I, I think I kind of alluded to earlier, don't like really think about what you're doing. Narrow your focus, be good at a few things. But I mean, the other side of that is, man, there, you, can, you're, you can afford to make a bunch of mistakes, right? Go hard, push yourself, make mistakes. This is the time to make them uh, so that you can learn from them. Um, and then get good at the foundation stuff. I think, and, and this is a little bit specific to my situation, but I finished uh, AP calculus or something like that in high school as a sophomore, which meant I didn't have to take calculus again until I was a sophomore in college. And that four year break in math really hurt me. And so, um, you know, I, I, in retrospect, I think I should have gone back and started again at Calc 1 because having those foundational classes, you'll be scrambling later you know, when you're four or five years in and you can't get through the closed form solution to something, uh, when you should be moving on. So really set your, like go hard in your first couple years to set your foundation strong, because you'll use, the, those are the building blocks from which you will do everything else.
Um, I have a question back here. There. So I always dreamt to become an astronaut, but I never get a chance to make it happen. So um, I was just wondering, like, for the younger generations, what kind of advice um, can you give for those who want to follow your footsteps and want to become an astronaut one day? Absolutely. So uh, there's a bunch of thoughts here. One, it's skill, luck, and timing. You control one of those. So just go, if you want to be good at something, I think it's important to do something you love or something you're passionate about it, right? We talked about Russian earlier. Uh, it's a thing on my desk and I'm not super passionate about it. Uh, I should be, but I'm more passionate about the other things on my desk. And so I end up doing the things that I love harder and I spend a lot of time on them. So I get really good at them. And so NASA astronauts come from a wide variety of backgrounds, engineering, science, geology, educators, and all of those people, the one thing or a couple things that are similar for all of them is they all have this exploration spirit. They always all want to keep learning and they're all really passionate about what they do and the result is they're really good at what they do. And so I think that's really important to go, just don't try and do something because you think it'll make you an astronaut, right? Do it because you love it. And, you, and we see the, you know, this, we've had a new class of astronauts come in since I joined. And those uh, astronauts on their applications, you could see, you could very quickly go, oh, that person only did that because they're trying to like check a block, right? Like they went and took Russian. Well, why, why, why are you taking Russian? Ugh. Like were you taking it because you like are working on a Russian engineering project, or you just were trying to, right? Or the other one you see is scuba diving. Uh, somewhere on some website, somewhere maybe Reddit, somebody said you have to have scuba diving. I had neither scuba diving nor Russian before I got this job. Right? I was just doing something I loved. Uh, and you see that, and well, were you doing scuba diving because you're like, you want a vacation to odd parts of the world, you want to go do that, or you're just doing it to check on the block, right? You got your license, but what did you do with it afterwards, right? And so you can quickly sniff that out, uh, but we love people that work well with others, right? That's really the key. There are, the technical side of being an astronaut is totally doable by the vast majority of the population. It's the people skills working with people working in a closed environment. Imagine hopping in an SUV with three other people, it's a total of four, spending 30 days in there and you're easily being and going to the bathroom in that spot for 30 days, right? You don't want the person who's just clicking their pen, right? <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! We're almost out of time. We may have time for so one. Or I've got one question here. Okay. Um, so Matt, as, as humans, we struggle to know what our limitations are, and one thing that comes in there is the, the sense of fear. So, so I guess my question to you is two parts. One, how do you um, manage fear? And two, what still keeps you up at night? Oh boy. He stuck to it. <laughs> <laughs> um. So let's talk fear. Uh, I went to Liberace University, so I'm moderately well-rounded in discussions. But <laughs> I, I think that's one of the reasons you go to the university like this, you can get well-rounded and have these kind of conversations and think about them deeply. Um, I think there are many sources of human fear, but I think one of the chief ones is the fear of the unknown. So you can, get, you can become not afraid of things if you understand them, or you know why it works or what's going on. Um, I, you know, I, I flew fighter jets for the Navy, I was a test pilot, I did some pretty high risk things. Uh, but I understood what was going on, I understood the risks. Uh, I had written the test plan with the project engineer to go to the test flight, that's a really scary thing. Uh, you know, for example, like we were flying a jet that had two seats, uh, but we intentionally didn't put the back seater in there because we didn't want to risk two lives because we had calculated the probability of loss of life. Uh, but I really understood the risks that were going on. Uh, and so fear, there's a fact, I knew what the risks were. I had an understanding, an engineering understanding. So fear of the unknown drives a lot of things. And I'll tell you a small story. I was on a commercial flight with my daughter, my oldest daughter. She was sitting by the window. My wife was to my right. I was in the middle. And we're coming in for landing on a commercial airliner. And uh, commercial airliners, as they slow down to the final approach fix, they drop the gear. You can hear the electronic. Like, there's all kinds of weird noises happening. There's shutters. There's vibrations. And if you know what they are, it's not scary, right? You see like weird vortices of the air coming over the wings, and we're sitting right behind them at the, you know, the port side flaps. And my daughter's looking out the window, and she's getting really scared. And so I just started 
verbally describing every noise, what it was, what was going on, why the flap was going down, what that means, what that does for the airflow, why that air is suddenly doing this cool thing over the wing, what's this, why are we in and out of the clouds? I just started explaining everything. Uh, and then was telling her things before they would happen. And then we touched down. We slowed down and we got off the off-ramp. And the woman in front of my daughter, in the seat in front of us, could hear us apparently. I'm kind of a loud person. And she leaned over the seat and she said, thank you. And I said, huh, what's, what? I, did, did my daughter not kick your seat? <laughs> and, and she said, no. She's like, I've, I've been afraid of flying my entire life, but because you explained everything as we were going, I was no longer afraid. So that conquered the fear of the unknown. Uh, I don't get on roller coasters <laughs> for a couple of reasons. There's a risk reward balance. I don't see the reward. I don't understand the risk reward. <laughs> right? Right? So there's a risk reward balance. And so that's my life. What I do professionally is I understand the risks and I understand the rewards. And I see great value in moving humanity forward. And uh, that's a reward for humanity. And so I understand taking the risk, and I, I work with the engineers at NASA, I understand, I go talk to the guys, I go where they build the rockets, I talk to the guys who turn the bolts. When I go to an amusement park, I don't see the person who's turning the bolts. Right? I haven't talked to them, I haven't seen the analysis. So I don't get it, I won't get on a roller coaster, I don't like it. I, I sometimes don't like flying commercial, but... Um, so I think that is, that's how you manage fear. The other thing you do, uh, is you, and we do this, we fly T-38 jet trainers to, because you can get in a simulator and it, you can always stop, right? And you're not gonna die in a simulator, unless like there's some sort of electrical fire uh, and there's a catch up, but that doesn't happen. I think there's been one simulator death in the history of simulators, but the, you don't die in a simulator, but you can die in a T-38. It's a 1960s airplane, I'm flying the same airplanes that Neil and Buzz flew around, right? They're the same 1960s airplanes they try and kill you on a regular basis. And so you have to go make decisions under stress. And so that, you know, the first, if you haven't done that in a while, it's, you're, you're kind of a mess. You have to manage the butterflies in your stomach. But if you do it on a regular basis, the term is stress and stress inoculation. Um, you can, that's actually a term in a research area in um, behavioral health medicine, stress and stress inoculation. So it's kind of, I, my, my analogy is like, if you think about the Cold War in a spy movie, and the spies take little bits of arsenic over and over again so that when they get hit with a big dose, they're fine, right? And so that's the idea. So we constantly put me under stress so that when I'm hit with a large amount of stress, I can cope with it. I've been inoculated to it. And uh, what, was your, what was your second question? That was a long answer to your first one. And you can't go on this next one because we're out of time, so you got a short response. Are they going to come? I'm, I'm getting like, <laughs> at least it's like, what's your, it, it was interest, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Um, an immense responsibility to not let humanity down. Thank you, man. I'm like really proud to call that to all.